Welcome to the Long Term Investor. With me today is Nick Majuli, Chief Operating Officer of Ritholtz Wealth Management, and more importantly, author of the new book, Just Keep Buying. He's also author of the blog of Dollars in Data. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. I appreciate it, Peter. So this, this episode is coming out, I think, the day that your book comes out or maybe a day after your book comes out. So anybody who's listening to this conversation can go on Amazon or all major bookstores. Having read it myself, it is fantastic. I know all of you are going to find something useful there. And Nick, I remember the first time reading your blog of Dollars and Data, and you were anonymous when you first started publishing. And I remember thinking, whoa, like... Who is this guy? Because every once in a while in the financial blogosphere, someone comes out the gates hot and you know, they immediately you know that they are going to be somebody special and a contributor to all the way that we think. And I remember reaching out to you and saying like, dude, who are you and why are you being anonymous? And I was really surprised to learn that your background wasn't in finance. So maybe before we dive into some of the great lessons within the book, Give our listeners and our viewers a little sense of your background and how you got to where you are today. Of course. And yeah, I appreciate the the kind words, Peter. Uh, yeah, I remember you still reaching out to me. Uh, but yeah, so at the time I'd started in early 2017, I was working at a litigation consulting firm. So when most people say consulting, they think of management consulting, which is like, you know, you're like forward looking, right? That's kind of how a lot of management consulting works in business. Um, but litigation consulting is always backward looking. So we're trying to say what happened in the past and like figure out, you know, damages, things like that. And so my background, I was an economics major. I took programming like my senior spring, my very last quarter in college, which is probably my biggest regret in college. I feel like I should have done it sooner. But basically, I got really into data. I realized like that type of consulting, litigation consulting was a great fit for that because I was going to get really good at doing analysis. And that's kind of what I did. I did that. I was in that job for six years and I, I eventually transitioned to the data team there and I kind of just got a data background. And so for me, it was always like analyzing stuff with data. And so I use kind of the skills I learned there. And I said, you know what? I've always loved personal finance investing. Why not apply it here? So that's kind of the big takeaway for me was just like taking what you know in your specific skills and circumstances and everything, and then just applying it to something that you really care about. In, th in this case, it was like writing about investing in personal finance. So, Well, you're a really great storyteller as well. And I'm not suggesting that storytelling is easy, but there are a lot of great storytellers out there. I think it's the way that you tell stories with data. And particularly, you mentioned some of the, the computer programming, the coding. It's the data visualizations that, to me, on your blog of dollars and data really stick out. They inspired me to almost try to learn to use R, which you always share <laughs> sort of some of the code background for people who want to learn themselves, which I think is super cool. But your book is filled to the brim with stuff that I think showcases that storytelling ability, showcases that ability to take data and tell a story with it. And I'm going to focus mostly on the investment section. There are two sections of the book. There's savings and investing. And I'm going to focus most on investing. But maybe you could start by explaining why you divided up the book that way and how someone might be able to decide whether they should focus their attention more on the savings or on the investing. Yeah. So that when I was thinking about writing this book, I knew I wanted to answer, answer a bunch of questions using data and stuff like that. And so that was like the main premise of the book. But at the same time, I said, what's the structure? How am I going to kind of tie this all together? And so the first chapter is kind of that way of looking at that. And there's like the saving and investing section. And what I mean is I can just ask you a basic question, right? And the question I'll ask is like, there's only two numbers you need. This is true of every person out there. Like I, I just need two numbers from you and I can tell you where you are on the save invest continuum. And then I can probably tell you where you need to focus, right? So the first number is how much can you expect to save in the next year? So let's just run some simple math. Let's say, I don't know, you're saving 500 bucks a month, right? So over the course of the next year, 500 times 12, 6,000 bucks, right? So that's, that's our first number, 6,000, okay? Now, let's say you have 20, and then the next question is, you know, how much could your investments return you in the next year? How much can they earn you? Like your investments, not how much you're saving, just your investments, right? So let's say, I don't know, you have 20,000 bucks and you're gonna earn a 5% return. So that's $1,000, right? So that's our second number, 1,000. So remember our first number was 6,000, our first number is, a th our, our, yeah, our first number was 6,000, our second number is 1,000. So which of those is bigger? And that's where you should focus. That's the whole thing. And so in this case, if 6,000 is greater than 1,000, that means like you need to spend more time saving money, investing it into income producing assets, and then having your assets 
earn you more money. So right, the idea is like this is lopsided. There's six thousand you can save yourself, and only one thousand your investments you can earn. But over time, as you save and invest, this number, the investment number, should go up and up and up, and they should be close to each other. And at some point, as you get older, and once you get retired and you don't save at all all of your stuff comes from your investment returns, right? Everything, right? And so I've seen this happen myself. Like I used, when I first started, like I, you know, I had very little to my name, but I was, I was, I could save a lot. So I started saving, saving, saving. And now I'm at the point where a bad year in the market could wipe out all of my savings for a year easily, right? Like you just have a bad time in the market. That's what happens. And you'll start to see that. And eventually when I'm like 65, I could use, I could lose years of savings in like a crash, right? And that's kind of the idea is figuring out, okay, well, where am I, you know? And, and based on where you are in this continuum determines where you need to focus. So so if you're someone who's just starting, figure out how to raise your income because it doesn't really matter as much about your investment returns, right? And I think that there's some simple math for this, like a 20% return on $1,000 is 200 bucks, right? But a 2% return on $10,000 is also 200 bucks, uh, 200 bucks, right? So it's like, these are the same numbers, but it's like, you just have a lot more money to start with. So I'm saying focus on getting more money first and then optimize your investment returns. That's kind of the idea. So I think that's like a good way to think about this and figure out where you are. And if you're somewhere in the middle, you should read the whole book and kind of use all of it. If you're really early, just focus on that income part. And then as you get older and have more money invested, really focus on the investing pieces. So, yeah. That's great. And you do have the book organized so somebody can treat it like an encyclopedia. And I think you even make reference to that. I read it straight through and I found that there was a lot of really great stuff, stuff on the saving side. Again, because I only have so much time, I'm mm -hmm. going to focus more on the investing side here. However, I will say it is interesting when I think early in my career in 2007, watching my portfolio go down 60% during the financial crisis, well, Losing 60% of very little money <laughs> didn't seem that important. And all I was trying to do at the time was find more money to put in the market. Whereas, yes, today I am focusing more on the investment side. And one of the things um, that's changed for me over my career and that I feel like I have to – you, there's conflict constantly, uh, mental conflict for people to understand is the issue of individual stocks. And you address that head on in the book by suggesting that people shouldn't do it. And I totally agree, but maybe you could explain from your perspective why that is. Yeah, so I think my argument's a little different than most arguments. I mean, if you if you ask most people or why you shouldn't own individual stocks, they're gonna give you what I call the performance argument. And this is the most common argument you're gonna hear, which is like, you know, you look at the data and most active managers, aka stock pickers, can't beat the market over a three to five year period, um, especially after their fees, right? So that means you're probably not gonna beat the market either. If the professionals can't do it with teams of analysts and research and all this money and resources, you're probably not gonna do it either. That's a good argument. It's not a bad argument at all. However, my counter to that is like, I mean, you can look where's where you can find this data. It's called SPIVA, S-P-I-V-A. If you look up SPIVA, you can look this up in any equity market around the world and you'll see somewhere between 60 and 80 percent are going to underperform. That's a performance argument. The argument I made in the book is more of an existential argument. It's more about your person, like how you feel about your career, right? And, and, and your investments like you can't prove it's very difficult to prove that you're a good stock picker, right? It's not like basketball. If you and I went to the basketball court, Peter, I have no idea your basketball skill, but if we played for 20 minutes, I can probably tell if you're decent, you're okay, you're really good, whatever. And I'm not even a professional basketball coach. A real basketball coach who's an expert could tell you exactly where your skill level is. I can tell you if you're even close to like LeBron James or not at all, right? So that's the thing. You, you'll know instantly. You can pick any person and they go and play basketball and you can know instantly their skill level or some, some range of their skill level, right? But with stock picking, you can't do that. You, it might take year. It might take one year, two years, five years. I mean, let's say you pick five stocks and they beat the market. Are you a great stock picker or did you get lucky? You don't know. I mean, it could take, honestly, I mean, to statistically prove you're a great stock picker, it could take 10, 20 years. I mean, Corey Hofstein's run the numbers on this type of stuff. And it's like, that's the stuff that, that messes with me. Like, I don't think I could be a stock picker just because like, I'll never know if I'm good. And like, okay, what if I was good and now I'm not good now? Like, you don't know if your skill's gone or if you're just getting unlucky. Even even the best stock pickers who are, who are undeniably, statistically the best stock pickers are still like go through bad periods. So like, you're gonna be in your head like, am I good, am I not, right? So if you wanna pick stocks and put a little bit of your money in there and have fun, go ahead. I have no problem with that. I even own a stock or two here or there, but it's like 1% of my net worth. It's just something I do for fun. It's not something I like, I think you do with the majority of your money. But if you're trying to do it for the bulk of your wealth, I think you're gonna get in trouble. And I think, especially right now, early 2022, we saw these tech stocks are down 60, 70, 80%. And I think people have learned that lesson now because even if they bought it early, like, wow, it went up so much. Now they're down so bad, they're actually underwater from picking stocks. So I think this lesson is being learned right now in real time. And I think that's something that, you know, I want to focus on. So 
I really like that argument. And it's something that's very hard for people who have been doing well to accept. And so oftentimes you're right. People point to the performance stuff. They show, hey, active managers lose. Hey, 40% of stocks experience a 70% permanent decline at some point in time uh, in their lifetime. But really think once you really grasp that everybody's really smart and even then we can't know who's skillful and lucky, it is very difficult to understand the competition you're up against. Um, it's not one-on-one -on -one with indiv individual stock picking. You know, another common theme that I feel like I am coaching people through is when they're sitting on a large amount of cash, whether that's from a windfall or they've just been saving in cash for a long period of time because they've been nervous about investing or whatever reason. And typically when you invest as soon as possible, that gives you a higher probability for higher returns. But a lot of investors prefer to dollar cost average into the market. And I thought the supporting evidence that you laid out, and this was very graphic heavy, uh, was really compelling. So maybe you could go through some of those arguments. Um, I know you can't recite data off the top of your head, but some of the baseline arguments for why it's important to invest as early as possible. Yeah. So, and I, for, for the record, I want to just use specific terms here because the term dollar cost averaging is used for a lot of things. And the original, I, my understanding, the original time it was used, it just means buying over time. Now, what you're talking about is like, if you have a bunch of money and you slowly average into the market. So I'm trying to rebrand this to call that averaging in because dollar cost out, like when you, when you get paid in your 401k every two weeks and you just buy, technically that's like small, you're just making small lump sum payments. That's technically what it is. But I call that dollar cost averaging. That's what people like to use most the dollar cost averaging you're talking about is when you're averaging in so let's just say average in versus buy now that's the kind of what i used in the book and i want to use those terms to make it simpler for people so basically on average you know uh if you do buy now versus averaging in over the course of just one year um you're gonna outperform about 70 percent of the time when you do buy now versus average in and the outperformance on average will be about five percent right so that's the those are the numbers right you can and that's it varies per asset class i've done it in income producing assets such as uh, us stocks international stocks real estate etc i've also looked at like non-income producing assets like bitcoin and gold and the outperformance is there and so it's like somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the time of periods you're going to outperform and you're going to outperform by something like three to five percent i mean bitcoin it's a lot more because the price has been just basically up into the right so let's ignore that one for now <laughs> but the point is like you're going to make more money generally by doing that. Now, I know that's not the only thing people care about. Why do people average in? Because they're worried about risk. And that's fair. So I think it just depends on how long you take to average in. For example, if you're like, I don't want to put it all in this month. I'm going to average in over three months. Go ahead and do it. Honestly, that, that performance difference is so small, it's not going to make a difference. But if you're someone's like, oh, I want to average in over five years, I think you're really going to take a hit doing that. And I think that's something where... You know, one year is not too bad. And so, like, I still wouldn't recommend averaging it over a year because, remember, the market can rip upward. However, one year is not that bad. It's 5%. So if you're willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to give up 5% for this, do it. That's the trade-off. I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't do. I'm just saying here's the data and you kind of think about it. I think you probably should generally go earlier. But the longer you wait, the worse it gets. So that's kind of the main takeaway. So if you want to say, okay, I'm willing to give up 5%, okay, then wait a year. If you're willing to give up 10% of your money, like an on average loss by taking two years, go ahead. But that's 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 the risk you have to, that's the trade-off you have to make. So that's kind of the, the main point I want to get across. It's not like, oh, you have to do this because I understand why people don't, but at least know why you're doing it and what you're willing to give up on average. Now, it could be worse, but that's kind of the point, so... Yeah, about once a week, I find myself saying you don't live in a spreadsheet and you have very clearly defined the spreadsheet answer. From there, it's maybe an exercise in minimizing regret. And I think because markets go up over time, that's why it's important to get in as early as possible. But I think you also looked at differences in risk and differences in valuation, which was something new that I'd never seen before. Maybe you could share some of the insights from that. Yeah, so as I touched on a little bit with the risk perspective, of course, it's riskier to get allocated earlier because, I mean, imagine you're 100% cash versus 100% in, let's say, U.S. stocks. You're, it's going to, of course, be riskier to buy everything now because you're getting more underlying exposure to the asset that's riskier, right? That's obvious. Um, at the same time, my counter to that is like maybe you should consider buying now but into like a less risky portfolio. If, if the risk is really worrying you, maybe it's the portfolio you're buying into that's actually the problem, right? So if you're trying to go 100% into a, you know, or 100% US stocks, maybe you need a 60-40 and you buy that now and then you can transition. There's other things. Obviously, there's tax reasons why you may not want to do that. But at the same time, I think you just need to think about risk a little bit. And I think 
risk matters, but it, I mean, the point of the data is to say like, hey, stop freaking out about this so much and like you're probably going to be fine most of the time. And so, and remember the only time where averaging in actually works, by the way, the only time statistically where it's going to work is when you start averaging in and the market starts dropping and it starts dropping and the more it drops, the better it works, obviously, right? So it, it's precisely in the time when you're the most scared to invest is the only time it's going to work. So behaviorally, you have to be like, okay, I'm going to average in and I'm going to keep averaging in no matter what. So you remember that. So like, this is what you're really giving up by by waiting. So you not only have to wait, but if you're if your waiting decision is when it's right in that 30% of the time when you're right, you're going to have to do it when the markets are crashing. So like, that's the time when no one, everyone's like, oh, I'm going to just wait it out. So like behaviorally, like it's bad for, it's like bad and not just mathematically, but behaviorally, it's really tough to pull off. So that's why I'm like, you probably shouldn't do that. Just get in and just, and just, you know, let the chips fall where they may, so to speak. Yeah, I love that call out on the behavioral side. Mm -hmm. Now in those periods, when the market is falling, um, and actually, you introduced a framework to the world through your blog during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It was sometime in 2020. And I remember immediately using that in client meetings, sort of reframing what the opportunity is when the market's down. Maybe you could walk us a little bit through that. Yeah, so I call it reframing the upside. And it's it's just, it's simple math that kind of shows why when you think about during a crisis, during a big crash, why it makes sense to buy. And so let's just, some simple math. Let's say uh, the market goes into a 25% crash. Let's say it's at 100, it goes down to 75, right? To get back to 100, that that asset has to increase by 33%, right? So even though we had a 25% drop, you need a 33% increase. Simple math, 0.75 times 1.3333 is 100, right? The same thing in March 2020, when I wrote it, the market was down 33%, right? So that's, you know, 100 to 66, let's say, right? To get back to 100, you have to go up by 50%. You know, 66 times point, you know, 1.5 gets you back to 100, right? So you need a 50% increase for every uh, 33% decrease. So basically every decrease in requires an even larger and larger increase to get back to even. So I said, okay, let's just ask, a, I asked a poll basically on Twitter. I said, okay, how long do you think it's going to take? And I asked this like March, around March, 2020. So like Mark was near the bottom. I said, how long do you think it's going to take for the market to recover? And based on that answer, I can back out your expected return, right? So if you think it's going to take one year, remember if the market's down 33%, we need 50 to get back to even. If you think it's going to take one year, then you're expecting a 50% return. So if you think the market will be back to an all-time high within a year, you should be buying. I mean, 50% return. Who doesn't want a 50% return? Everyone wants a 50% return. So if you think under a year, you have to be buying. It would be ridiculous. You had any excess cash, right? Um, or sell bonds and go all in on the, if that's what you want to do. What if it's going to take two years? Now, technically, the math isn't linear. I mean, if you really do it, it's not exactly, you can't just take 50% divide by two and it's 25. It's actually, it's less than that. But let's just, let's do it linearly just for practical purposes. So in two years, basically, the the rough return is 25%, right? Over five years, you know, it's going to be, you know, 50 divided by five. It's basically 10. It's actually eight in reality. So I'm like, even if you think the market's going to take five years to get back to an all-time high because of the COVID crash, you're still looking at an 8% annualized return, which is like kind of the market average. So like, even in like the most, in the craziest scenario, you're still getting the market average. So everyone's like, oh, I'm not buying right now. It was bonkers to me. I'm like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, even in like, a, I took five years to get back to an all time high. Like you're still doing well. And here's the funny part. Within six months, we we're back at a high. So like the annualized return, even my most liberal estimate of a one year recovery was too conservative, which is the craziest part. And so on an annualized basis, you probably had a hundred percent annualized return because from there to the top or to a new high, it happened so quickly. You're basically, you got a hundred percent annualized return, which is like absurd, right? To think about now, of course it didn't have to play out that way. You know, we can be like, well, what about the depression? Like, you know, you in 29, it crashed and then it went down and down, you know, so that happens there. Those are cases where it doesn't happen, but Either way, it's like that's how I reframe the upside is like when it's down big, as long as you believe it'll recover eventually and you have a reasonable timeline, you can then back out what your expected return is and say like, hey, is this worth it for me to take this risk? So that's kind of how I like to look at it. I, I absolutely love that. I will share a link to that blog post mm -hmm. in the show notes on the longtermainvestor.com. And, and Nick did us all a favor there creating a linear example as, as opposed yeah. to the exponential equations. But I'll make sure that those exponentials, those more real life ones are in the show notes as well. And one thing I think that's worth pointing out is that the average bear market is just under two years. So when you're going through this exercise, and I remember seeing you know this in March 2020, and you put that out there, just thinking probabilistically through that exercise. And truly, probability is the only rational way to make 
decisions about an unknown future. As you pointed out, Nick, we couldn't have known that the market was going to rip higher within a month or two the way that it did. But if I'm sitting there as an investor and I know that most bear markets last under two years and I see that getting back to the new all-time high is going to happen in less than that, I mean, that's a really great mm -hmm. opportunity. And if you're afraid to rebalance, it's a great way to think about it. You mentioned, Nick, you know, pushing some of your bonds into stocks if you decide to get more aggressive. All things that I think just a, reframing that upside is a tremendous example um, you know, of, of reasons to do that. And the other thing I really liked actually about that chapter, Nick, was the story that you told leading into it about sort of what was going on in the world when you started thinking a little bit more optimistically. I remember having similar experiences once in the financial crisis and once later in the pandemic, but I, I wonder if you'd just share that for listeners as well. Yeah. So basically, you know, it was like, it was literally March, I think 22nd it was like the Sunday. And I think that Monday I, the market bottomed and I actually wrote the, I actually released on a Monday. I usually release my posts on Tuesday, but I was like, this needs to come out. Cause I was getting so much like what's going to happen. Everyone's freaking out. Markets dropping 10% here, 8% there. Right. So everyone was like really worried. And I just thought of, I just did this math. And I said, you know what, this is how you have to look at it. I feel like if you look at it this way, then it like, it makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit more reassuring about what's going to happen. But that one morning, I remember I went down, uh, there's like this escalator into this grocery store I used to go to in uh, in Manhattan. And I went down to the atrium and there's a guy there like arranging flowers. And I was like, why are, like, I'm worried about canned goods. I'm worried about toilet paper. Why is this man arranging flowers? And I'm like, this guy is acting like, hope, like all this stuff's not even happening. I'm like, there was this moment of just like normalcy. And I was like, what am I, I'm freaking out. And like, this guy still cares about flowers. Like is flowers really the thing that we need to care about right now? And I was like, maybe that's like that moment where I was like, my gosh, like the world's gonna be fine. And I don't, I just, I thought that privately and obviously the world could have gotten worse and I, that that thought would have went away. But I mean, it turned out OK. And, you know, um, yeah, so that's it. Basically, we recovered eventually in some ways, you know. Well, that really resonated with me because I know in um, February of 2009, I went on a ski trip with some friends that I was sort of feeling uncomfortable about spending all that money to do it. Um, and I remember we're out after skiing and people are at dinner and pulling money out of an ATM and that was an 18 month sort of downturn. And I'm near the end. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like people are acting like we're not in a massive recession. And it's that zooming out moment. And it, to your point that you just made, you don't even know that it's going to be the bottom or it's going to be the end, but it does. Sometimes we get all caught up in the numbers and the fear, but when you zoom out, it does give you a little bit more perspective that the one thing that all crises seem to have in common is that they end. And kind of pulling out of out of the cloud of of the negativity can really be a big deal. You know, a lot of people want to sell when things are down. You actually call out, I think, a very crystal clear framework for when to sell. You should sell when you're rebalancing or there's a losing position like tax loss harvesting, or to meet your financial needs. Obviously, you know, retirees need to sell some of their portfolio. But the one I want to focus on is on the concentrated position. And it's related to that individual stock argument a little bit, but not exactly because there's a lot of executive compensation these days. Stock compensation is more and more common, so you end up with concentrated positions. Help me uh, explain a little bit why you find this to be an important reason to be a seller. Yeah, so I mean, I know the book's called Just Keep Buying, but there are times when you have to sell, as you said. And uh, one of those, as you brought up, is you know selling selling concentrated position and. Sometimes, you know, you're, you can have a position, let's say you were buying Apple stock since 2015, or you're right, you've been getting equity compensation in the firm you're at, right, where it's like, a, let's say it's a publicly traded company where it's easy for you, to, it's, it's liquid and you can sell it. Um, it's just risk concentration, like you can hold it and that's fine. And so you can definitely, I don't recommend selling all of it because remember, we're trying to do regret, regret minimization. And if you sell all of it and it triples, you're going to feel kind of dumb when assuming the market didn't triple. Um, but also, if you sell none of it and it crashes, you're going to feel pretty stupid, too. So I'm saying find some sort of figure out what what level of like risk you're willing to take with that and then find a selling schedule and sell over time. Remember, you have a tax budget. There's a lot. It's a lot more complex than what the book leads on. But it's just getting, you know, prodding you for the idea. And I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm all in or all this. That's way too risky. And don't get me wrong. Those people end up being super, super rich. Like there's a guy called the all in Tesla investor. And that's all he buys is Tesla stock. And he's doing very well. But right now, I mean, there's a little bit of a drawdown. And so like if it keeps drawing down, if Tesla stock were to crash further, that that's going to affect his finances in, in some way. Now, it also there's a lot of other things here because 
there's questions of like, okay, well, like maybe you lock in a certain level of lifestyle. Like, okay, this is locked in. My my general money, I have bonds, I have like my general ETFs and everything, that's locked in. And then everything above that is your risk money in the concentrated position. And that's fine too, right? You can, but I'm just saying, get yourself to like lock up your level, like get to a, fa a fair safety net basically. And then you can risk the rest. I know people that don't have any safety net. Their safety net is like, I'm gonna be back working. The joke is back at McDonald's or I'm, you know, <laughs> gonna be the richest. Or I'm gonna be, you know, a multi, multi-millionaire. I'm like, don't do that. I think it's silly. Like sell a little, get to a, a decent safety net where you'd have a decent life and then let the rest ride if you want to. So I think that's my thinking on it. So last question about the book, you finish mm -hmm. out talking about the most important asset, which I think is really great when you're talking so much about finances. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So I think, and I've, I've expanded this argument since even on the blog. So like I wrote this piece and I still like there's, there's an expansion to it, but basically your most important asset is your time. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I use this, uh, this analysis or this thought experiment from Peter Atia where he, he gave a talk and he was like, you know, um, you know, Warren Buffett, if you could trade places with Warren Buffett, you can have all his money, all his celebrity contacts and do anything he can do. Like, but you have to be his age now. Would you trade? You know, would you make that trade? And it's very grim to say this, but it's like, I think most people wouldn't do that. Right. And I think the reason why is because they know like, okay, money's worth a lot, but like, I don't want to have to be, you know, 90 years old or however old he is now. Right. And so I think people realize that at the extremes, but like, if you start taking it down to like a smaller step, like that's true kind of throughout your life. I think most, most people who are, you know, 70, 80, or no matter how rich they are, would probably easily trade places with you and I just for the time. Right. And I think that's just keeping that in mind, how you use your time, how you spend your time. And that's why I kind of wrote the book when I talk about the save invest continuum, I'm trying to get you to focus your time better on your attention, where you spend your attention. So if you have a thousand bucks to your name, don't spend, you know, 20 hours optimizing your investments and creating spreadsheets and stuff like I did when I was 23. Don't do that. It's because it's not necessary. I mean, it's cool for learning. If you like it, that's fine. Like on its educational piece, but like it's not going to move the needle. It really isn't. Like I would, I should have spent more time like learning data science or getting better at programming. That's what I should have done. And I didn't. Right. And so until later, um, and that's kind of the, the idea is like figure out, you know, where to spend your time because it's, it really is our most precious resource. I love it. Um, Nick, two questions to close us out. The first is what books would you recommend to others that were highly influential to you in some of the messages that you portray throughout the book? Uh, so I, I know this is not a cop out, but it's really like you need to kind of specify. And so I can be like, if you say, okay, retirement, for example, there's a book sure. by Ernie Zelensky called how to retire happy, wild and free. And that is a retirement book. That's not about money at all. So like when you, when you go down to a specific topic, I can think of books where you're like, oh, let's think of like mindset stuff, you know, uh, like Ramit Sethi, I'll teach you to be rich or, um, get good with money. Tiffany Lishi, like th there's a lot of great books out there. You know, if I'm talking like hardcore investing, I go to my go-to is William Bernstein, right? He had a, the intelligent asset allocator, the four pillars of investing. He has the, uh, I think he's an adult, uh, investing for adults, like a four book series talks about correlation, a lot of really technical stuff. So I think it really depends on what you're looking for. You're talking behavioral, you know, we're gonna be talking Morgan Housel and Jason Zweig, right? You're talking your money, your brain, you're talking psychology and money, right? There's a lot of different areas. And so I can't, I'm not trying to cop out. I'm just like, I need to know because there's, this web is very big. And so if I just had to give you like a one book or something, <laughs> I can try, but like, I think there's a lot of like nuance in that. And I don't wanna say, read this. And it's like, that's not gonna answer. Like, once again, it's like, it depends where you are, depends what you're looking for. So I think you need to dip down. But I, I just threw out a bunch of names of different books you guys can check out. Um, they're all very good. Um, but yeah, I think, and I, a lot of things, I like to just read a lot of nonfiction stuff too. That's just interesting because like interesting stories, you know, like one of my favorite books is called deep survival. That's about literally how to survive like out in the wilderness and people who survived in like these crazy circumstances. I think it's cool. I think there's a lot of parallels with investing and thinking about survival and like the investment markets. Um, but yeah, there's just like a lot of good stuff out there. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. If you have more questions, like dig deeper, I'm happy to give you more recommendations. So, well, that's largely what I was looking for. I can vouch for literally every title you just listened to. And I think mm -hmm. that's one thing that people who are trying to learn more or reacting to market news, sometimes I wish they'd just pick up a book. And so I'm starting to ask my guests this question more. I'll make sure to link to all those suggestions in the show notes for anyone who's mm -hmm. interested. Nick, last question. What does it mean to you to be a long-term investor? Yeah, this is a this is a hard question, I think, because I think it really, it does matter on time horizon. Like if you're 80 years old and let's say you don't have kids, you're not going to pass money on to anyone. Can you be a long-term investor? Let's say you have, you know, five to 10 years left. 
can you really be a long-term investor? I don't know, right? That's a question, right? But if you're like, oh, I'm going to pass on to my kids or something, then maybe you can be a long-term investor. I think for most people, though, a long-term investor is someone who just generally believes in, you know, progress of human civilization. You think there's going to be economic growth and all that. And you have, I mean, if you're an investor, the whole point of investing is like you buy something in the expectation that like there'll be growth and economic growth and all this stuff so that the price goes up. And so you, you're giving up something now to have more later. If you didn't believe in that, why would you be investing? You don't just hand your money out to someone just for, because, right? So I think the main premise is like, you have to be kind of like optimistic about the future. I believe, I think that's kind of some deep seated belief there and that the, the how much optimism you have is different i'm obviously very very optimistic i'm called a permable which is obviously I mean, my book's called just keep buying how much more permable can i get but um i do believe in this stuff and i think like the data is showing it in terms of you know life expectancy childhood childhood mortality infant mortality all these things incomes are rising all these things are like all these metrics are moving in the right directions and i think it's going to get better going into the future of course there's drawdowns like just like in markets there's drawdowns in human civilization right now there's a conflict in russia and ukraine and I, by the time this airs i have no idea if that's going to be over what's going to happen right so um but yeah i think generally I'm, i have a very positive you know expectation for for human civilization going forward yeah, as our friend Morgan Housel says, invest like an optimist, save like a pessimist. <laughs> yeah. You can do both when you read your new book, Just <laughs> Keep Buying. Nick, I'll make sure to put all of your blogs and social media handles on the show notes, but do you want to tell people where, where they should find you if they don't go check those out? Yeah, if you ever have questions for me, just DM me on Twitter. My uh, handle is at dollars and data, all lowercase dollars and data. So just you can DM me. My DMs are open. I'll be happy to answer anything. Um, and yeah, my, my website's of dollarsanddata.com. So pretty straightforward. Um, you just reach out to me there. Cool, Nick. Well, this was fantastic. Thanks so much for joining me. And to everybody listening, we will see you again soon. And until then, to long-term investing.